right, well, as John said, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I'm a real estate lawyer. Uh, my fancy colleagues in the M&A world call me a dirt lawyer. Uh, they say that affectionately. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not the oldest profession in the world, but it's close. Um, the, before I became a, a lawyer, I was a, a scientist. I was a coastal geologist and geophysicist. And one of the things that you do in the hard sciences is you look for patterns and relationships. And so as a coastal geologist, one of the things that we would do is we would look for relationships and patterns between the modern marine environment, uh, which is what I was studying, and the ancient billion-year-old uh, rock formations. And so for example, we might climb to the top of a mountain and observe marine fossils at the top of that mountain in the rocks. And we might conclude from that that the top of that mountain was at one point at the bottom of the ocean. It's those relationship and patterns that we look for. And you do this because those relationships and patterns begin to form a predictive tool. Uh, the more you know about modern systems and ancient systems, and you can see the relationships between those two, and the more you understand how the ancient system evolves, and more importantly, why it evolves and what it's seeking to solve for, what evolution is seeking to solve, the better of a predictor tool that you have. So today, I want to use that same science that, we, that I learned as a, a geophysicist and a geologist and apply it in the context of real estate. Um, and what I hope to do is to show you that there is a very demonstrable relationship between the way the antiquated system of real estate works and what technology potentially offers us. And I'm going to do that, I'm going to illustrate that through a series of word associations using common parlance of blockchain and applying it to the context of real estate. The goal here is to show you that there is no better match, in my opinion, for the application of blockchain than in the real estate arena. I'm going to stop there for just one second, and I want you to keep one fact in mind as we, as we proceed here. Less than 30% of the world's land is registered or tracked in any way. What this means is the farmer, the rice farmer in, a, in the Philippines or in a, another undeveloped country has no way of extracting the capital and the value of the land that that, that farmer owns. There's no ready-made legal or financial system because there's no tracking. There's no registry for that land. That means that more than 70% of the world's population is not able to tap into that value. What we want to do is we believe that we can do better. Uh, and we believe that blockchain potentially offers us an opportunity not only to uh, enrich ourselves, uh, but also to improve society in doing so. So let me take you backwards into the antiquated world of real estate. In blockchain parlance, this is the genesis block. It's the genesis block for a particular piece of land in the Dakota territories. Uh, and this land was deeded by the federal government to a one Charles Ingalls. Charles Ingalls is the father of Laura Ingalls Wilder, the writer, the author of Little House on the Prairie. This is the genesis block for the prairie, circa 1886. Subsequent conveyances of this land would be done by deed, a physical instrument that then gets recorded in the county in which the property is located. That recordation, over time, begins to look like this. This, in blockchain parlance, is a ledger. It's a centralized ledger. We call it, in the real estate world, the grantor-grantee index. Wonderful term. Uh, you notice all of the metadata here. Uh, so we have the name of the, the grantee, the buyer, the name of the seller. We have the type of the property that's being conveyed. We have the date of the deed and the purchase price and the like. 
when, when a new piece of property comes to me, um, what I do as a seller, a buyer of property, for example, is someone comes to me and they say they want to buy the most expensive building in the US. One of the very first tasks that we do is we make sure that the seller who is selling it to us, that they own it. And we do this through what's called a chain of title. The similarity of that name is striking to what we're talking about today. We go backwards in time, and we look at all of the predecessor records. And the way that we do that is we go back to that grantor-grantee index. And I should say that in the majority of counties in the country, in the US, in what we consider the developed world, in a modern economy, they are handwritten, long form, stored in the bowels, on paper, parchment paper, even calfskin in certain instances. So when you want to do a chain of title like this on a historic building in Manhattan, you will literally go into microfiche and hard copies and dusty boxes and the like. Clearly not an efficient system. When we do this backward look all the way through, we're trying to, one, prove that the person who's selling it to us owns it. And that's equivalent to, in blockchain, the double spend problem. We're trying to make sure that this piece of property hasn't been spent twice. We're also looking for the accuracy of the legal description. The legal description here is represented by these terms, 1 West 28, 2 East 56. Occasionally, you notice the change, 2 East 56, all of a sudden gets changed to 2 East 57. Occasionally, we discover an error or something other than an error, but something that doesn't match up in the chain. This, in blockchain parlance, again, is called a fork. The similarity to the chain of title in real estate, again, is striking. These forks are sometimes errors. Sometimes they're more nefarious. The word that we use as lawyers for fraud is opportunism. That's when we're representing the fraudster. <laughs> uh, the error arises when you introduce humans, and fraud uh, arises when you introduce humans to the equation. The real estate world, as was Sandy mentioned earlier, uh, is highly people dependent. It causes me to pause and say, I think that we can do better. Surely with the advent of technology, blockchain, or other solutions that might come, we can take a repeatable exercise, such as looking backwards in time with respect to that building, and put a layer of mathematical certainty on it. Surely, in today's economy, we shouldn't be writing things out on parchment paper or entering them in long-form ledgers in county offices. So you know what's coming, blockchain. I mentioned relationships and patterns earlier. That that's what we look for. And we do that as a predictive tool. The similarity between this image and the grantor-grantee index, to me, is striking. They're one and the same. Maybe the color has changed. But essentially, this is the grantor-grantee index, and the grantor-grantee index is blockchain. I also mentioned evolution. Evolution is solving for particular problems. This is the natural evolution of real estate. It would not allow us to make a mistake. It would not allow fraud to be committed. Instead, we would stop when the 56 changes to the 57. What are the other implications, many of which you know about? Well, we remove humans from the equation. So-called disintermediation. Companies, title companies, suddenly evaporate. You no longer have to send someone to Virginia to fix a, an error that's been written, as Sandy mentioned earlier. Escrow companies disappear. They evaporate. Similarly, we automate the process. Uh, it is entirely conceivable that when a company searches for a new headquarters, such as Amazon recently did, and they find it and they ultimately uh, control it, it's entirely conceivable that that process from start to finish, the prompting of the need for the search to the end, the acquisition, is completely automated. No humans. 
We create data and analytics in this new world, a whole wealth of knowledge. Currently, that knowledge is locked up in dusty boxes in, some, in the bowels of some county. Imagine if we could create a digital fingerprint for every single possessory interest that exists around an office building. The actual land, the physical structure, the leases within it, the air rights above it, the water rights beneath it. All of that are layers and layers of blockchain. This is the least tangible and most difficult concept to convey. As a lawyer, I spend an inordinate amount of time negotiating and allocating risks and responsibilities and remedies and the like. And what I'm convinced of is, is that as we tap into this abundance of data and make the entire process more transparent from start to finish, I'll no longer be guessing what my adversary, my counterparty, will ultimately agree to. It will be self-evident. The data will speak for itself. There will be what I refer to as a migration to the mean. And I think that that will be a higher bar and not a race to the bottom. We'll be able to base our decisions on data and not instinct. So let's look at the opportunity in closing. I operate in this little teeny tiny sliver down here on this graph. If we view coin offerings as a proxy for the implementation of blockchain, there's a huge opportunity in this tiny sliver. In 2017, the application of blockchain to real estate occupied less than 1% of the overall coin offering ecosystem. That 1%, or that less than 1%, is completely untapped. In 2017, just the purchase and sale of real estate, not financing, not leases, not water rights, not air rights, just one part of the transaction occupied $475 billion in the economy. There's a huge opportunity for us here. These, what I could come up with the top of my head, are all of the individual pieces and components that could easily be applied to the blockchain and where there's opportunity for uh, extracting value and knowledge and, and the like. I'm going to finish here where we started. There's a saying in the business community that you should follow the money. And in my opinion, if we follow that 70%, follow the good, not the money. Follow the impact that we can have. The rest of it will follow. Thank you.